If my life has a message to share, it's this. Allowing others to diminish the value of your voice can be devastating to the creative, youthful minds of today. But anyone can overcome this awful conditioning at any time. We can move from despair to hope when we find positive mentors who encourage us to take control of our future. Now, my experiences are most relevant for African-American women, but I'm guessing many of you can relate. For over 20 years, researchers have written about the impact of silencing black girls. Anthropologist Signicia Fordham states, learning to be silent can be so stressful that it sometimes results in abandoning the efforts to stay in school. Black women have been conditioned to be silent. It often starts early in the home and it gets amplified in the classroom. That was true for me. Fortunately, we can conquer this. We can enable young black women to have positive educational experiences, become confident in their critical thinking skills, and clearly see their value in society. I lived through those silencing forces and eventually found positive mentors that enabled me to speak up and help others as well. To show you how far I've come, I'll share my early conditioning with you. I was frequently told, you talk too much. You ask too many questions. You don't know what you're talking about. Or go somewhere and be quiet. That caused me to distrust the value of my ideas. Growing up, I loved 60 Minutes. And I absorbed news like a sponge when I was nine a segment on the Vietnam War aired. After watching, I informed opinions and I needed to unpack them. So I turned to my grandfather and I boldly said, I wouldn't have gone to Vietnam. He immediately interrupted me. See, my grandfather had proudly served in the military. And what did my nine-year-old opinion on a war matter? Undervalued and marginalized at nine. My mother was no different than my grandfather. While I studied Spanish, mom would laughingly say, I don't know why you're studying that. You probably won't ever leave Indiana. I recognized my mother's world views were smaller than mine. And for a black woman in the 70s, her options were limited. She couldn't fathom a woman moving beyond traditional roles. Still, her dismissiveness undermined my sense of possibilities. In high school, I experienced teachers that radiated negativity. For example, my senior English teacher, he would review my homework, then look at me and say, don't worry about becoming a great writer. He never liked anything I wrote and didn't provide any useful feedback. My high school advisor, she happily encouraged white students to go to college but it wasn't the same for black students. Our college inquiries were stonewalled. Fortunately, my grandparents insisted that I go to college. 
despite my own doubts. My college English professor, he dismissed my experiences. See, I wrote about people I met in a housing project all the time. And they were typical people that they used drugs, they gambled, but they positively impacted my life. So I wrote about them. My professor's biases prevented him from seeing that my black experience could be positive. And while this is not overly silencing, I heard a message. Stay silent, learn quietly. With only one black faculty member on the campus at the time, I hardly had anyone to turn to. I craved intellectual conversations, but I didn't feel like I belonged. I didn't feel like I fit in. So I ended up leaving college, questioning my academic abilities and my self-worth. That led to 10 years of wandering. I found industry similar to college. Fade in the background, don't voice your opinion. I worked a variety of jobs. When I would ask supervisors about policies, they would tell me, you don't need to know that, just do your assigned task. When I applied for promotions, I would get admonished for going after what I wanted. After 10 years of aimless work, a magic moment arrived. My friend Beverly had noticed I had been going from job to job to job without any clear or passionate career direction. At that moment, she became an instant mentor. She asked me the question that will redirect my entire life, literally. She asked me, what are you passionate about? I realized I had seldom heard that question. And I responded, African studies. I had always been interested in African history and cultures. And to pursue this, I applied and was accepted to Martin University. Now, I didn't know what I was going to do with this degree. And I was a little nervous about my academic abilities. I found Martin University to be a breath of fresh air. I found great mentors and a strong support network. University President Father Boniface Harden would ask us, what are your goals and how can we help you meet them? Other administrators would ask the same question. Almost on a weekly basis, we got tired of asking that question. Professor Ron Clark, he made it a point to engage us and ask us our thoughts in each class meeting. He even asked me if he could use my senior research project in a course he taught. These people cared about my voice, my thoughts, my goals. They encouraged me and validated me. And yes, I was challenged. My African history professor, Dr. Maswan, made me write a paper three times to prove that I could be better and told me, I expect better from you because I know you can be better. He wasn't diminishing. He was sustaining higher expectations. I was encouraged to learn more, to grow my knowledge base and to avoid any unuseful influences. My professors even encouraged me to go to graduate school. So I did. I found myself at Indiana University where I would encounter more change and more challenges and become a better person. I walked on the campus of Indiana University as if I belonged in every space I entered. I engaged with others, 
students and teachers were learning from one another. Questions were always invited. Conversations were always welcomed. As a graduate assistant, I had supervisors who would allow me to show me their, my capabilities and encourage them. And this is where my love and my career for higher education began. And since then, I've accomplished many things. I've become an academic leader. I've traveled domestically and internationally leading academic workshops and presenting at national conferences. But it's because of the great mentorship that I've had along the way that I've been able to do these things. I've been given the opportunity to become an academic leader at Youngstown State University as their assistant provost. And I've been shown great examples of mentoring where I've been allowed to mentor 100, over 100 students. Like these two. I was able to assist Sadasia, a first generation college student. She had great family support, but was overwhelmed by the many opportunities, the many options she had at college. She just needed someone to talk these things out with her. Sadasia flourished. She became a campus leader. She broadened her horizons at a, with a semester at sea, and she began embracing higher education as a profession. She has since completed her master's degree. Taylor, another student, another student I mentored, she came with minimal support. She is extremely intellectual with great critical thinking skills and a talent in many areas. She needed someone to engage her in conversations to follow her best path. And while Taylor did decide to leave college after her second year, I continued to mentor her without judgment, without criticism. Her extraordinary achievements have allowed her to be in these spaces that are very creative for her. She is now a budding playwright, author, and performer. She's using her voice to go into creative spaces where she can thrive. And I would say, if it hadn't been for the great mentorship that I've had, I would not have been able to mentor these two young ladies that I'm very proud of. And since my career and educational journey, I've learned the best practices for mentoring. So if you're interested in becoming a mentor or you're already a mentor, I suggest these approaches to use for effective mentoring. One, understand your biases. We all have them and they impact how we interact with others. Two, develop a cultural awareness for the people you mentor. When you understand someone culturally, that connection is stronger. Three, listen to the people that you mentor without criticism or diminishing their voice. This is your learning opportunity. And when black girls tell you about the indignities, oppression, and violence they face in educational environments, believe them, help them find resources that will assist them in their professional and per personal growth. And lastly, don't be afraid. We make mistakes but we will overcome those mistakes also. Now, I've used these methods in mentoring, again, hundreds of students, and they've been effective for me. 
So I, I invite you to join me. And remember, when we assist others to elevate, we will elevate ourselves. Thank you.